Today's podcast is one of my favorite style of episodes because we are hearing from a regular podcast listener who I met in pretty unfortunate circumstances, to be honest with you. But we just got chatting about what they learned from the pod, how it helped them. And they also had some amazing tips for international medical graduates. And so they kindly offered to come on the podcast. We caught up again and they just dispensed some amazing practical tips for international medical graduates. So if you've listened to our other episode on international medical graduates, where Ed goes through the more kind of technical tax side of things, and we talk about the pension, today is more of the practical side of things, you know, how to come to the UK as an international medical graduate, how to find your first house, why you probably ought to get a bank statement, and controversially, why you might not want to work in a big city like central London. So, so many great tips. And this kind of episode just makes the podcast so rewarding for us because we absolutely love helping you healthcare professionals that are helping us specifically me at the moment with my hand and just a massive thank you for everyone who's out there all day every day helping people to get better to know that we help you in some small way with your finances through this podcast really motivates me and Ed to just keep going on and on with the episodes. I think we're on 180 episodes now, approaching a million downloads. We've never missed an episode because we love it. What does help us is if you hit the subscribe button, if you can leave us a review and a rating, that helps other doctors and other healthcare professionals to find this podcast and start changing their financial future. And obviously, this podcast is not advice. The opinions are the opinion of the guest and not financial advice. Hopefully that clears it up. Let's get into the episode. So it is my absolute pleasure to welcome to the podcast today, Mr. Akshdeep Bauer. Hi, Akshdeep. Hi, Tommy. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. And like I told you before, I'm a big fan of your podcast. Yeah. So last time we met, it was in less happy circumstances for me. But, you know, me and you and just you coming by to visit, let's go through how we met, shall we? And then we'll get into what we're covering today because, yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, like you said, it wasn't in the best of circumstances. You'd come because of a, an injury to your hand. And that's how we came to, you know, we came to know that you were there admitted under, you know, plastic surgery for your hand, essentially. I came through... I was doing trauma at St. George's at that point, and I spoke to one of my junior colleagues who told me that, you know, there's Dr. Tommy Perkins who's come under the plastic surgery team. And it was a bit of a shocker, you know, having seen you on screens first, and then, you know, I find you lying on a hospital bed. It was a bit of a shock to me. But yeah, anyway, we got chatting, and I felt there was, there were a few things that, you know, I could say on your, through your medium to help uh, international medical graduates and, you know, essentially people like me who've come over from, from different countries to the UK and trying to settle in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was so great to meet you. It was really humbling for me to people that saved my life and my limb, which is back on and functioning, for me to try to thank them. And so many of you were podcast listeners and have got a benefit from what we've done. So that was amazing for me. It was definitely a low point for me. So it was great to meet podcast listeners like you in George's and I'm in George's all the time. So if you see me wandering around George's, just come and say hi. And also make a suggestion on how we can help you more because that's exactly what we're talking about today. International medical graduates, because you are an international medical graduate and you wanted to share your experiences and what you learned. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I just forgot to say, I also met Mrs. Perkins and uh, she's absolutely lovely. <laughs> She is, yeah, really lucky to have amazing support. And obviously, thank you so much to everybody who's been involved in putting this back together. Function-wise, pretty good. Probably by the time this podcast goes out, I'll be back in George's having the middle finger X-fix applied and then a bone graft because the middle finger is just needing a bit of work. But, you know, I think that's pretty solid kind of pincer grip there. I, I, it's a pressure on to hold a pen. There you go. Yeah. I'm going to try and pick it up. I mean... on... Oh, I picked it up. Yeah. Yeah. If people knew how, how bad it was to start, you know, uh, they would be amazed at the at the kind of work that's been done. Yeah, I want to show the before photo because actually looking at that has really helped me. But honestly, it's really gruesome. But basically, like, you know, this entire bit was chopped off, you know, so mm -hmm. so yeah, it is. It's pretty bad. Okay, so let's get through your that's my story. 
Uh, that's not going to help anyone except people with a niche interest in hand surgery. Let's get into your story because you mentioned that you're an international medical graduate and you had some things yeah. that you'd learned that you wished you had known. So yeah, tell us a bit about how your journey to come. Yeah. So essentially I am trained in India. I did my medical school over there. I did a bit of orthopedic training in India. I went to Japan first and there was a bit of a problem in terms of, you know, the language and the food. Essentially the sushi that you taste over there is quite different to the sushi that we have, you know, elsewhere. So I couldn't, you know, stay there for long. So I did a bit of a traveling fellowship there instead of, you know, what I had planned. And then I came to the UK. This was back in 2017. And since then I've, you know, been a trained in the UK system. I've trained at King's College NHS Trust. I've also worked at East Anglia in Norfolk and Norwich, St. George's doing trauma. And now I'm going to Royal National in Stanmore for a foot and ankle fellowship. I've also taken up the British oh. Orthopedic Association SAS role currently as the council member. Amazing journey. So wait, you, you can speak Japanese presumably, right? <laughs> I used to be able to speak sentences, but the problem is I was in a place called uh, Tohoku in Sendai, which is a prefecture, a, a state, which is essentially four hours from Tokyo. And their dialect is, you know, like completely different. It's like, you know, it's like the difference between English in London versus rural Scottish, you know, so like chalk and cheese. And I couldn't understand a single word that was being said in outpatient departments. So that was a problem. That's impressive though. Like, yeah, to, to, wow. Okay. I love that. So amazing journey. What would be your sort of biggest tips for maybe let's break it down from like international medical graduates. And we have a lot of uh, international listeners. So if you're an international medical graduate and you're thinking about coming to the UK, then let's break it down from like, once you get here, what to do, and then like reflections on your journey so far. So let's split it into three kind of logical parts. That's all right. Yes, absolutely. I think the first thing to do is, you know, make sure you don't cut corners. You need to have passed your exams, which for, you know, for a surgical training, that would be MRCS. If not a surgical training, I think you do, you need to be your PLABS. There's sometimes your English language exam, but there's, you know, there's enough information on there. Now, coming to the financial aspects of, of all of it, you do need to speak to your HR when you're coming here. And that has to be weeks, if not months in advance. And the reason is when you come here, you need to have some sort of document on you to be able to open a bank account. Now, if you don't have your, your contract and everything sorted out, if you don't have a place to live, it's hard to open a bank account and not every bank will allow you to open a bank account. So that's something to keep in mind. And what some people do is, you know, they do speak to people beforehand. They speak to, you know, some other person that has come to the UK before and that's useful, but then the rules keep changing. So I would suggest, you know, you speak to your HR a few weeks to months in advance and sort out your contract, possibly also have a hospital accommodation if they allow. Another useful thing I can think of is, you know, try and not get a job in, you know, london manchester the big cities try and get a job you know at a smaller place first and the reason i say that is one the cost of living will be way cheaper and the other thing you would have a truer taste of the english culture if you live in a big city you're you don't get it's a melting pot of different cultures just like any big city so say for example i'm in india and you know i would say london is similar to uh, delhi or mumbai in a lot of you know in a lot of ways but to get you know, if you really want a taste of English culture, you have to step outside these boundaries. So for me personally, I think living in Norfolk and Norwich was an amazing experience. People had spoken about, you know, oh, it's a 95% white community and you would, you know, there would be some racism there and things like that. But I personally found that the people were a lot warmer. It's, it's a big rural farming population there. People are just, you know, generally nice to you. And it, it was an absolute pleasure to live there. If I, you know, if I hadn't come, if I had uh, no more training to do, I would probably have settled there. Super interesting to hear that perspective. But yeah, I never really thought about that. But yeah, cost of living massive and good to hear that you enjoyed East Anglia, Norwich. And uh, yeah, I have no, not worked out there myself, but it sounds awesome. All right. So that's good tips. And you said to get in hospital accommodation if possible. Why is that? Yeah. Sorry, I should have elaborated. So 
the reason I said that was, I, I'll tell you a bit about what happened to me. Okay. So a funny thing, I had spoken to an HR and uh, we had set a date that I'm going to come to the UK on, let's say, 9th or 10th of October, 2017, whatever. And what happens is the HR gets another job one week before I'm supposed to, you know, I'm supposed to land. And all communication is off because there was no handover. Okay, so so now I've landed in the UK and the only person I'm in contact with is not in her current job. And I had hospital accommodation arranged, but nobody knew that there was hospital accommodation for me. So I had to essentially, you know, I had two massive suitcases in my hand and no place to go for a bit, which was a bit scary, you know. So So that is something that... And the other thing is you have to... When you rent a place to live, it is so useful to be on the ground and have visited those places rather than, you know, just buy something online. So that's why it, I think if you can get a hospital accommodation, even if it's for a couple of weeks, I would strongly suggest you go for it. And these are something you, these things are, you know, these are things you can easily negotiate with the HR. Some trusts, if they're desperate, they also give you an allowance, which is a relocation allowance. So, so these are things, you know, that, that you can easily ask for. If you don't get them, you don't get them. But, you know, there's, there's no harm in asking for them. If you can get a, ho get a hospital accommodation, you look for, you know, appropriate rental accommodation in the vicinity. And that's how you get it. Yeah. Okay. Awesome tips. It must have been pretty nerve wracking turning up and then being like, I've got nowhere to stay. So that must have been pretty stressful. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you, you did it yourself, right? You didn't go through an yeah. agency because I'm aware that... So I went to work in New Zealand for a bit and you can do that yourself, which is the hard way, or you can do it via an agency, which is the easy yes. way, inverted commas. I did it the hard way. I don't know why. It sounds like you might have done it the hard way as well. Or I did. is there any like, you know, what would you say? Yes, I did. I did it the hard way. But what I would say, Tommy, is I, I enjoyed the process. You know, uh, I enjoyed looking for places to live. And I actually, very interestingly, I didn't go to a flat straight away. So I lived in a massive English Victorian house. It was owned by an English lady, a lo lovely lady. Shout out to her if she's listening. And we basically stayed there. Me and my wife stayed there for two years. She had her parents living in Chichester. We were in Beckenham and in Southeast London. And essentially we used to stay with her. We had the, you know, like, like I told you, we had a taste of the English culture, but a lot of that was, you know, thanks to her. We went to her house in Chichester for Christmas had, you know, summer barbecues and, you know, uh, yeah, we used to share food and it, it, it was amazing for us, you know, to see the way English people live and she got to know about Indian culture through us. So it was a win-win. And these are things that, you know, you can explore when you don't have kids, which I didn't at that point in time, especially, you know, pe people like us, if you're, you know, if you don't have a package, you know, these are certainly things you can explore. And yeah, it's it would be, it's a great place to, you know, to do these things. Amazing. You're making me reminisce about those heady days where it was just me and my wife and no children. <laughs> but having kids is great. But yeah, it sounds like you maximized it, your child free time. That's awesome. So that's some tips from like when you arrive. Like what about yes. when you get here? Give me some like your take homes and, yes. and tactics. Yeah, what I would suggest is you know but let, let's start with you know renting a flat essentially so i have actually made a checklist on you know the things you need to look out for and you know s starting with you need you know you need to be able to you need to be internet savvy that's the first thing okay so you need to be able to research things well on your own okay there's you know loads of good websites where you can do that you need to look for a flat through an agency Make sure you can you read the Google reviews or the trust pilot ratings for that agency because I've been bitten once where I had rented a flat which looked pristine, but that was, you know, it was very recently plastered. And then I found out that the flat had a mold problem. And my daughter was, I think, newly born or was, was a few months old at that time. And then I had to change flats and it's a big hassle. So, you know, those are things which you need to really consider. And then when I, in retrospective scope, you know, when I look back, I saw the Google reviews, I saw the, I saw the trust pilot ratings, which weren't, which weren't great. So it was my fault. 
but I was desperate for a flat at that point. And that's why I say, you know, try and live outside the city, you know, if you can, at least for a bit, you know, because you would have, you can probably get a better quality flat or even, you know, rent a house maybe. For me personally, I was renting a house in Norwich for 1100 pounds, which was a massive three bed town house which, next to the river. I could walk down to the river. So, you know, if you're into those things like me, then that is some something, you know, you can consider. Regarding opening a bank account, there, there's loads of, you know, there's loads of options. But, you know, like I said, you need to have a contract in hand. And they ask for two or three ID proofs, which you need to be able to open a bank account and have an account with a bank, which is local to you, which offers good saving interest rates. These are things that you, you know, you've spoken about in your podcast, certainly. And I would strongly recommend people listen to your podcast to get their finances in order. Yeah, but these are like really good practical tips from someone that's been there and done it. So this is totally invaluable. Uh, and yeah, like a uh, three bedroom townhouse by the river in Norwich for 1100. I'm guessing yeah. 1100 doesn't get you much in central London, right? <laughs> a one bed flat if you're lucky. Yeah, yeah. It could be a bit hectic with the family in a one bed flat. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay, so you've navigated all of that. What about like when you're here, you know, like career development and things yes. that you've kind of learned as you've been here that you wish you'd like, you said the retrospectoscope. I love the retrospectoscope because everything's easy retrospectively. So looking yeah. back, what would your tips be there? Yeah, uh, I don't know where to start really because there's loads, but what I would, you know, in, in a nutshell, think about your portfolio development, which is, you know, which is something that international medical graduates are guilty of not doing enough. You know, you need to have a very well-rounded portfolio, you know, starting with quality research, things like that. You need to also be financially savvy. And the reason I'm saying that is to be able to do your job properly, you need to be 100% focused on the job at hand. And when you've got your finances in disarray at home, you just can't do that, you know. So, you know, get a chance and there's plenty of free stuff available. You know, I would start with your podcast. There is the shared business services, free webinars. You go to your local trust and there's free financial, you know, financial health checks. They have, you know, specialist NHS financial planners coming in for advice. I'm sure your website has links to a few. I've actually approached one through your website. So, you know, there's loads of things. and absolutely by all means opt in for nhs pension i have a few friends who who opted out initially for a couple of years and then i you know it, it's just pure mathematics you know if you don't understand it just ask for help and basically you know i prepared an excel sheet telling a couple of my mates on you know what they're missing out on and it's a no brainer you know like like you always like like you guys keep saying so you you need to opt in for nhs pensions you know the the other thing is very important, building up your credit, which unfortunately I certainly wasn't very aware of when I came here. And it's especially useful when you're buying a house, obviously, or if you're purchasing a car. So, you know, things like getting on the electoral register, making sure you pay your bills on time, making sure you're not maxing your credit card, simple things. But, you know, every little of these things, you know, counts. Yeah, I love it. It's just it, most of this is really simple. It's just that you just got to know about them and do them. So this is really helpful. So going forward, what kind of challenges are you facing at the moment, both with career and finances? And where do you kind of see your future? What are your plans? Yeah. So in terms of finance, let, let's start with finances first, because I have very recently, you know, bought a house. I'm about to move in actually next month. And a big thanks and a shout out to both you and, you know, Ed for, you know, helping people like us. It's, you know, awesome free education. I started investing early, invested in Lysa because of you guys. So, you know, and this was, you know, back when the podcast had just started. So, uh, yes, another important practical point. If you're under 40, like me, go on the Lysa. It's a no-brainer again. Okay. Have Lysa for you, your partner. I have also started the junior Lysa now. So, you know, that, that bit is sort of taken care of. And essentially I'm, I'm planning for the future now. I haven't set a retirement date yet just because, you know, I'm, I like to be a busy body and, you know, I don't think I, I'm one to retire early. So I'll probably, you know, 
keep grinding till I'm 68 or, you know, I don't know if the pension age, they, they'll make it to 75 by the time, I, you know, us, we retire. But yeah, I'll keep working because I enjoy my work. You know, I, I enjoy it. I am planning to, you know, well, hopefully I'll be a consultant in a couple of years. I'm just going to stand more for six months. And then I am possibly going to Frimley Park or the Windsor Foot and Ankle Fellowship, as it is called, for another six months. And then looking for consultant jobs, essentially. Awesome. Love it. And yeah, you said to you that you don't want to retire because you love your job. That is really refreshing yeah. to hear. But also with that plan that you've outlined there, you're sorted, you know, you're investing, you've got that sorted, your pension sorted. So you've got options going forward, which is the main thing, just not closing up options in case things change. That is really great to hear. I can't tell you how rewarding it is for, we love doing the podcast. And I think just knowing that we're helping people like you and then people like you helped me with this, it just brings it full circle. So it's so rewarding for me in a selfish way to have you on. I think that your tips is going to be so useful for people going forward. And thanks so much for everything that you do and for coming on the podcast. It's easy to not come on the podcast and keep all of that wisdom to yourself. But that's what Medics Money is all about, really, just sharing information with each other so that we can all make better financial decisions. So that was awesome. I wouldn't give out your email because there's about forty to 50,000 people a month listening to the Medics Money podcast now. <laughs> okay. Is there any kind of, if people wanted to get more information from you in a kind of easy way what would be the best way and feel free if you don't want to do that because it could get hectic really no i mean i don't mind this i'm on twitter my twitter handle is at actually power and you know they can direct message me it's not a problem perfect awesome uh, we'll put your twitter yeah. on there does this mean i won't be seeing you around george's anymore because you're going to stanmore right i am but you know i'm happy to chat to you whenever and like i said i am part of a few groups now i'm in a leadership position at british orthopedic association as well and we would love to have you guys you know there's i think you know despite what you guys have been doing for a while financial planning for doctors there isn't enough information out there we need to disseminate it further we need you doing more stuff more nhs pensions webinars more you know financial planning for doctors webinars uh, we need you essentially we're definitely doing that. We're going to get a date in that for that because we love doing that. And if you are wanting us to come and do a talk, a virtual is best. But if you go to our website, not you, because you got my email, so we're going to sort that out privately. But for everyone else, go to our website, go to contact us, I think it is. And then you can fill in like when your speaking event is and how many people and stuff. And we will get back to you because we love doing it. And there's still a need for it as well. So yeah. thank you so much it was great to see you again in happier circumstances hopefully i'll see you around george's but if not great luck at stanmore as well and thank you so much for everything thank you so much thank you appreciate it <laughs>